Brian, if we might, if we make Brian a yeah. plastic shower. Oh, this is Brian back. Should I love that? Either? Yeah, if I admit her. And then Brian. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. awesome. I don't know if I can unmute. Hi, Mai, how are you? It's all working well. <laughs> no one else can see the chat until, can you hear me? <laughs>
what you should do is put the uh, HDMI cable there. Hello, everybody. Great to see everybody in the waiting room. I'm sure it won't be very long before we start. I'm Bryony Bax, editor of MBIT 244, and um, looking forward to seeing you all and listening to all these fantastic readers we've got tonight. And um, thank you for being here with us tonight. Let me know where you're calling in from. It'd be like nice to know whereabouts we all are. I'm on the North Norfolk coast. Uh, it's been thundery here. Um, and uh, I'm self-isolating, which is why I'm not there but I'm very healthy and COVID free so far. So that's the good news. Anyway, leave a message in the chat and let us know where you're zooming in from. Talk to you later. Wonderful, thank you.
Is there a button on the mic? Can't send her voice back in here, I'm afraid. So. You can't hear me? No, I, mine, perhaps. Oh, we're going to have to do this. I wish I knew how to sign language. All right, well, I'll send. Hello. Can we do like captioning? Hello. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> <laughs> My first day. Uh. <laughs> My last day. But I love you. And congratulations. Oh, can we, I'm just wondering if I do, if I turn it up on here somehow, whether or not that would. Can you hear me now? If can I put me? the volume, can we hear you now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, hello everybody, has it started? Yes. Okay, great. Oh, I'm so sorry I can't be there with you tonight. I'm absolutely heartbroken. 
but Boris has pinged me, unfortunately. Ironically, I was at a local arts centre trying to be supportive and got pinged. So there we are. I'm stuck where I am um, till Sunday. But I wanted to say thank you to everybody who's put in so much hard work for Ambit 244. It looks fabulous. And um, of course, it's my last edition as editor. I'm retiring. Um, I turned 60 this year and sort of had a sort of think about how I'm going to go on for the rest of my life. So, and Kirsty has been such a fantastic managing editor that I really think she's going to make a, a wonderful editor and take Ambit to whole new heights. So I was just going to hold up my first Ambit. This was my first Ambit 214, so 30 issues ago. Um, and I'm so proud of where we've come and I've loved working with everybody at Ambit. There've been so many people. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to everyone for supporting Ambit. Please continue to support Ambit. It is a fabulous place where new talent can come and be published. And it's really important that we all get behind these, these um, magazines and these movements, in, particularly in this space now. So thank you to everybody and can't wait to hear everybody read. Lots of love. Mwah. And congratulations to everybody. There's Simon there. There's, There's Simon, Simon there. Around. Yeah. Hang on a second. Yeah. Hang on. No, he's he's out. He's taking the dogs for a walk. <laughs> Going to come back later. <laughs> He'll make a surprise appearance. Yeah, lovely. Okay. Right. All right. Thanks, Bryony. Yeah. yeah. Have a great night. Great. So thank you, Bryony. Can we give her a round of applause, please? Like, like eight years of doing four courses, it might not seem like a lot, but you're actually, I mean, in this one, we have a phenomenal number of poets, and everyone has to be kind of
Hello everyone, I uh, just have to put the uh, hair net on the microphone. Um, we're all going to be here today. It's such an honour to be here and to be in such an amazing company. Here, what's going on here? 
So we're just going to wipe out what is going on there. So that everything is in there. Yes, and the audio is required. I don't know if that microphone can be boosted a little. Yeah. How's that? Is that? Is it through the mic? Is it through the mic on our end? Yeah. You, so, can I just check? Is it better going here? Or is it better going here? Is it better? Is it better talking into the computer? Not that close, but yeah. Um. <laughs> Please don't say that there, but yeah. Um, so much better nearer the computer. Great. So we're going to be better doing these. Maybe we should turn the light off. <laughs> um, in what I have learned in the last year on Zoom, maybe this is better, right? Uh, so, yeah, much kinder. But if we could talk into the microphone as well, readers. Should we just restart that so that the Zoom people can hear you later again? Okay, we're going to rewind, if that's okay. I think that's far kinder. Great. Right. It's good you've got. It's good you've got a second one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right, Leila. Okay. Let's just backtrack here. We'll go into the matrix for a little while. If you could tolerate the poet's reading here as well. So I need to be super close. Thank you. Uh, hello, people of Zoom and, and everyone else. <laughs> um, here's my poem again. Chance for me to make some edits. Um, so, this is called Casting. It's about a play I wrote when I was four years old and the roles I gave people and a reflection on the roles we get cast into throughout our lives as well. Casting. Dictated to my mother, typed by my father, everyone had a role. Hannah the good fairy, Emily the witch. I the queen, Levant my Armenian king, and the quiet boys were trees. They loitered sage edges, rustled on cue, flickered dappled eyes and flex roots in plimsolls as they reach for their neighbor's brittle grass. Bowing canopies, tipping nests with ping-pong eggs into laps of applauding parents. But mostly they did what they did best, stayed silent. Thank you very much. <laughs> And now we've got a second chance with Jack Cooper. Uh, well, as I said before, it was between science and sexy. I guess we're going sexy for the second round. Uh, 
I see. Um, I guess uh, slice up for people who've already heard it. Strangely, I was inspired to write this poem thinking about how I did the year of human section in my studies, um, which was probably the most impactful thing I've ever done, completely changed my perspective and everything. And then it ended up being quite sexy, so I don't know what I said about it, but um, <laughs> so this is demonstration. We practice anatomy in the sweat of your single bed, wanting to know every part of the person. Una, patella, phalanges, frenulum, filtrum, lunula. Language so sharp I can press it in you like a pin. Here, this here is a place that I can love. Uh, and I didn't think I actually did the title of so the second one is, the first gene-altered squid has thrilled biologists, which is an article from National Public Radio that you can read to learn more about the sex of squids. You were a tough egg to crack, each failed experiment a warning to those wanting to inject you with CRISPR, a tool to clear the colour from your skin as proof of concept the squid could be cutting edge. Now look at you. Animal drawn in invisible ink, your russet removed like rust soaked in vinegar. Remember, stained glass without the stain is still a window through which we might see anything. Thank you very much, Jack Cooper. And next up, would you like to come around this way, maybe? Or? Yeah. <laughs> this is, yes, if you go, this is Amelia. And if you remember that this is the microphone also, that would be great. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, this is only my second reading I've ever done, so I'm a bit nervous. Woo! And also, uh, forgive me, because I have to read off my phone, because I'm actually reading an abridged version of a short story I have in the issue. Um, it is called, And I Was Never Here Anyway, So. Um, I don't think I'll explain it any further. <laughs> I'll just read. Okay. The first time I saw him, he was wearing a red and white check shirt, which had plainly been ironed, and which, being so redolent of gingham and of all-round bucolic innocence, would have looked very little house on the prairie on a girl. But he wasn't a girl, so instead it looked like he had a girlfriend to look after him, a docile little handmaiden to do his shopping and to advise him on what looked smart and casual, and that always makes a man more attractive. Or at least I thought so. I don't know whether this is because then the man seemed unavailable, or because it was made plain that he was not averse to care, that is, to being cared for. I liked the idea of a man who responded well to care. Yes, because that's the sort of fellow, that's the sort of fellow I slot right into, the sort that requires care, I mean. Might you want my care, is what I thought, straight away, I admit it. Also, he wasn't bad looking. In fact, he was good-looking, albeit in that aggressively normal, bland kind of way, which I tended to find appealing, like an aged fat sheep boy. His hair was the same colour as the fake wood laminate on the desk. Even his eyes were a sort of sandy gravel colour, like a desert or a road. There was something unending about it. He looked like a fine, upstanding, not-too-young man. You know, wholesome, like a well-baked granary loaf. The first time we WhatsApped, I was in bed and just about to turn my phone off, but no matter. I believe his message was more important. The dialogue which unfolded on the little screen was very serious, and for a long while I found it difficult to recalibrate my persona. I joked around as best as I could at first, in spite of his not being especially responsive. Maybe I even said something as crude as, for it had rained, I got wet going home today. He didn't say, that's what she said, however, as I would have expected from the others at the office, and I started to feel annoyed, even snubbed. Eventually, and out of the blue, he wrote, 
Is this a conversation or not? Well, I was shocked and hurt for a moment, but I quickly replaced that with shame. I said, yes, of course it is. I apologize for being silly. He proceeded to regale me with his impressions of our colleagues and boss and to give me the rundown on the game he believed each of them was playing. He told me who was trying to impress who and who had the power and who was trying to take it. And he told me how he wasn't going to let anyone take it from him, for one. Not from him, no way. He'd been in Saudi. He knew the tactics. I typed exactly. I typed exactly a lot. There wasn't much else I could say. I had the sense that he was enjoying himself. That made me enjoy myself too. The next time we got out, he was in crisis. He was in crisis because he'd gone out for a massage. Not that kind of massage, he clarified sonally, though I'd said nothing. And had become angry when loud Chinese men's voices had started through the wall. He'd banged heavily on the wall a few times and had even yelled, shut the fuck up. Naturally, these Chinese men had subsequently stormed into the room and he'd had to run, half undressed as he was. He'd run down the road and was typing to me as he was running. He thought they were Chinese mafia and that they were in a car hunting him down. He wondered whether he'd have to leave the country. I typed lots of, oh my God, as the story unfolded, and then he typed, stop interrupting. <laughs> well, I should have known, but one never does to see. Thank you. Thank you. It's great writing. If you want to read the whole story, it's quite brilliant. It's kind of like a, a blend. It, I think the language that she uses just kind of cuts it up, rather than kind of breaking everything up into little pieces. But your dialogue, it just kind of smashes, smashes through. It's really good. So, right. Um, and Patelia Sopping, right? Have I got that right? Peltier. Peltier, correct. Yes, yeah, very nice. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's also like Emilia, my second reading um, and my first, my first poem, <laughs> my first published poem, so I'm really chuffed and a big thank you to Anne Bitt for organizing this event and for choosing my poem. Um, it's, um, it's a poem that is inspired by um, uh, Natalie Diaz's Pantu, uh, and it's called um, My Brother at 3 a.m. And after reading that poem, this memory popped into my mind of uh, something that happened when I was 13, growing up in Canada, um, something that happened to my best friend, Nancy. Nancy's in tears on the phone. She's taking pills. I can't wake her. I tell daddy. He drives us there. Wait here, he says, but I follow him upstairs. She's taking pills. I can't wake her. The bedside light struggles to shine. Wait with me, I say. But Nancy goes in there. Nancy's in shock, can't dial 911. Her mother's light struggles to shine. Will she die? Oh God, will she die? Nancy's in shock, I call 911. They take her mum, we go for happy meals. She will die. Oh God, she will die, I asked Daddy as he drives us there. They took her mum. We eat our happy meals. Nancy's in tears. She drops the phone. Thank you. Um, let me get this right. Um, Peltier. Peltier, top pick. Yeah, what a beautiful poem, eh? That you can make something so move, move, you know, can cause emotion in such a short space, right? Very, very good. Thank you. 
Uh, so we've just got one more reading in this first half, and then we're going to have a break. We're going to play in some videos for people who study coffee here this evening for being part of the great pinged or the ping generation or whatever we're in. So we will take a break, play some videos. I don't know if we'll be able to hear them in here or not, but I will share them on social media afterwards anyway. So, but we can have a drink at the bar. But firstly, this is Matt Duggan, who's come from Newport tonight. And come on, come on. Have you got your? Just remember that their mics in there as well. Oh, right. Yeah. So just in there, yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, ignore it. <laughs> I've just put my condom on. Now, you know. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be here this evening. I've not read for 18 months. Uh, I need another meeting for that, I think. And I'm really, really proud uh, to have a poem in this issue of Amber. Unfortunately, it's about to. <laughs> it's a very strong poem, but I can't want it to So this is called Outbreak. What did you do during the outbreak, Sam? I carried the dead and infected day after day, bed to bed, slab to slab, body after body until the locust came. England's rose is withering, Dad, for I'm the witness of no prevention. Wuhan to Madrid fell to the mass, and they believed that the rose of England would never be affected. Though the butchers formed a petticoat excuse, and we all fell behind the mass. Her petals turned a putrid black. Isn't it sickening, Dad? Watching the sun through a glass window after winter had rained for 92 days. We social distanced ourselves and heard the latest death count on the news last night. We could see the great toilet bowl scandal of 2020 unfolding. Local politicians made a tidy sum, large investments for a new antibacterial super spray. And if we ever resurfaced our bodies, would they be augmented? an advanced upgrade. Two extra holes placed for that second pair of eyes. An oval-shaped mirror sewn into the soles of our feet, where we walk in woodlands at midnight, barefoot along grasslands where ghosts stirred in our sleep. How might the world end for us? Would we become thirsty silverfish living underneath cracks? piping, in a world above our shrinking heads, absence of light and movement, our nature broken and mutated underneath mother's breaking surface. What did you do during the outbreak, son? I carried the dead and infected, day after day, bed to bed, slab on slab, body after body, until the locusts came. Thank you. And this is a, another Caribbean poem. Uh, this was written before the lockdowns. This is called Kindness in an Age of Pestilence. When the theatre went dark, the stage, a fence of glass without an audience, Forming masses, blissfully paranoid, stocking supplies in double-locked garages. Keep me well and far from breaths of pestilence, far from the infections in hospitals, and far from the performing pantomime horse who breathed Darwin virus on the weak. Between cracks of shameless promotions of death 
and profit. Wash my hands from the blood of government and seek only kindness from strangers and those who remember how and what it is to be human. Thank you. That's great work, well, that's a master class in how to deliver um, the poem, isn't it? Right, should we have a break and play some, um, play some poems here? Mike. This is Mike. I'd like to say thanks to Mike Philip Smith, who is at the back here, who was working on Ambit back when I was published, and has been ploughing through as production editor for forever, actually, and but also reading an editorial and just a total star. Tonight he's turned up and has just totally helped. Another, yeah, it's, it's you know, he's, he's brilliant. So thank you so much, Mike. <laughs> right. I don't know how this is going to work. Let's see, eh? But yeah, help yourself or, you know, get, uh, get some drinks um, whilst we play these in. That's the intention, yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 Hi, I'm Hannah Hodgson and I'm absolutely thrilled to read you my poem which is in the latest edition of Ambit. Ambit has been one of those bucket list journals that I've wanted to get in for many many years now so I am really very grateful um, to the editors that chose to put it in. Personally um, I live with a life limiting illness which means I use all sorts of services that um, you maybe wouldn't expect by my appearance um, and I have a disease which affects every single cell in my body and how um, they function and um, it's all very complicated but it's degenerative which is quite a scary thing to live on alongside um, but poetry has helped me to it certainly isn't therapy but it's helped me to kind of work out where my feelings are coming from and um, if there's some you know societal type ableism thought pro process going on in my head if there's some self-hatred or some self-love or worry for family members it's quite a um unique form in that it's honest but you can hide it behind your images um quite often the poem i'm about to read is quite dark but when you live alongside death and serious illness for so long darkness is almost chronic and um, you develop a different sense of humour uh, from that a very dark sense of humour if you like to call it um, 
but I find that keeps me buoyant. So here we go, here's the poem. Being afraid of the dark doesn't prevent the arrival of evening. Anne Boleyn was painted in her final moments with both arms relaxed at her sides, soft faced. Her scepter, now her right radius, her cape invisible, weighing on her shoulders, her crown a headache soon to be gone. Beautiful in feigned ignorance, I emulate her in front of my family at hospice doors. Thank you so much for listening. I've been Hannah Hodgson and I hope you have a good day. Hi everyone, this is Gerald. I'm very excited to be a part of Ambit 244. This is my contributor poem, which is entitled Joshua. The names which multiplied like flowers, harlot, 
innkeeper, whore, were the ones I harvested at the blistering door of a life's honest work. My tavern muscled into the city wall like a limpet conch, where men could put away their sandals after riding and be nourished. Yes, threshing a living into rights and wrongs never replenished the spice cabinet, and who had not, at least once, smoothened out the body's currency in exchange for shelter. One night, from across the Jordan, two men arrived to spy on Jericho, their tunics bearing shadows of daggers at the waist, foreheads gleaming like knives. How could I turn them over to the king's soldiers when we've all heard how their god sliced open the Red Sea so they could traverse its brackish wound? I tuck them in exchange for the lives of my household when this wall would later collapse like a garment and the city stripped to ruin. In the roof, among golden bales of drying flax, which was where I left my old names and old allegiances. Those years I witnessed the signs but chose to believe only in circumstance, like wildflowers at the door, things no longer put up with or left as they are. Thank you. Is that okay? Every stolen artifact 
every village stomach. For the crevice of your navel, I'd see you standing at the top of the VA building, watching the security team recoil as you sing. Britannia is mine, the sugar and the cane, gnashing your one true tooth. It's a collection of letters or notes written by a barrister to his cleaner and her responses. And the notes are collected by the barrister's son who is having an affair with the cleaner. 
Thursday, 7th of May. Good morning, Azar. Did you for any reason climb into my bed last week? Lawrence. Thursday, 14th of May. Fragrance, Ms. Akbari. My sense of smell has always been keenly developed. I recall my father saying when I was just 11, that knowing my strengths and weaknesses as he did, my career choice was between perfumier and barrister. He was a friend of Oliver Creed. If you've never encountered one of his scents, you must go to Selfridges at once. It is a, it is a life-changing experience. I knew which of the two professions father preferred and followed him into the bar. It has been a good career, albeit one with long working hours, but I have provided well for my family in terms of living standards, holidays, and of course the lovely house you clean, to which subject I'm about to return. My nose scent, by the way, has not diminished, and that is why I knew when I climbed into my bed shortly before midnight two weeks ago that I smelt your very individual fragrance which contains an extract from the Atropa Belladonna. You will know it as deadly nightshade. I had recalled the scent from our meeting a month earlier. I thought long and hard about the reasons why you might have taken to my bed, and they included the following. One, you were, because of your studying, very tired. <laughs> Two, you wished to test the comfort of my bed as say, compared with yours. Three, you were feeling unwell and had to lie down. You may first have lain on top of my bed, but requiring extra warmth ventured under the sheets. Four, you had lain in my bed as a bed or dare, perhaps you took photographic evidence, I believe it is called a selfie. I must admit that I discarded all of the above theories, having found after your visit last week, at around 11.30 p.m. when I was checking under my bed in order to satisfy, satisfy myself that it had been vacuum cleaned, a pair of red and yellow striped male underpants. They were most certainly not mine. While closer inspection of the sheets on the freshly made bed revealed no evidence of other activities having taken place within, I later discovered that you had washed an extra set of bed linen. Miss Akbar, you chose not to answer the question I put to you last week. This week, I do require an answer. Have you for any reason been sharing my bed with a man for your mutual sexual gratification. You may be able to explain away my discovery quite innocently and to my satisfaction. My hope that you will do, do so is sincere, Lawrence. This is the reply from the cleaner. Mr. Mountview, I'm so ashamed. It is true or true. For the past few weeks, I have been using your bedroom and regrettably others too, for lovemaking with my new boyfriend. It was very much at his instigation though. I take full responsibility for my behavior. Mr. Malthew, I plead with you to forgive me and offer me another chance. It will not happen again. Truthfully yours, as are. Thursday, the 21st of May. Dear Azar, please find monies covering a calendar's month, a calendar month's cleaning offered as payment in lieu of notice. We had no formal contract, and therefore no notice period, but I feel it is right to make this settlement, even though you are being dismissed for gross misconduct. It only remains for me to wish you the very best for your future studies and career, Lawrence. P.S. Please return the red and yellow striped underpants to your boyfriend. They are in a waitrose bag by the front door. Thank you.
That's James Wall. Thank you very much. And his stuff, as you can see in the kind of the cut in the new edition that we're celebrating tonight, in the back of this, it's kind of wonderfully laid out. Anyway, it looks really beautiful. Uh, Stephen Barrett, congratulations, good job on that. So very nice. Right, so Asa Gatan is a poet who is going to share the work with us now. Hello everyone. Can everyone hear me? What's um, what's the chances of this thing flinging off? Hitting me in the, in the face. Um, well, um, it's a, it's an honour to get a poem published uh, in Ambit. So um, thanks very much for accepting it. Um, I'm going to read the poem, and it's called "The Park." I forget what page it's on now, but it's on one of the pages. I know that. Um, and then I'm going to read another one. So there you go. So this is the part. And I, sh I should just say that I, I wrote this last year. So I uh, hope, well, yeah, it was a difficult year last year. I wrote it last year and I uh, hope you enjoy it. This is the part. Flesh ripening, still untattooed. Fulminating lungs, fell rosettes of tree. Force chestnut, aspen. Ash. There is less past to devour them, to reward ambivalence. From underneath branches, they zap vapor trails, forms made invulnerable. I was once a dream, battling to sculpt itself, to mangle my reflection. The park is clothed with streets, hushed with middling. In its winding, people lose themselves. It is made placid by sheer and monoculture, piped onto beds. It is woodland clear and replanted to a copse. There is no stench. It is inedible. In, it, it cannot recall being scared of itself. Hold it there. This is, I read for a while. Uh, this is my second and last poem, um, and it's called uh, Periscope. Um, and yeah, it's about how maybe, maybe not, like sometimes you don't know how good things are or how good things, how good you've got things, maybe, I don't know. Periscope. You're on your dad's shoulders, a periscope. His grip looped around your ankles, the width of your mum's wrist. The bobble hat he got for Christmas, parboiling his head on this balmy afternoon. You clamber over him in the cafe, lay propped up on elbows on the bench seat, chuntering, surfacing the nibble of his finger, interrupting our conversation. And rightly so as it holds precious little twinkle. Three summers later, pink streamers on the handlebar of your bike whistle in the breeze as you discipline your baby brother, Mussolini, staggering, drunk, wearing nothing but a nappy. Your dad complains that his life gathers dust in the attic, in unlabeled plastic crates, 
too blessed to comprehend that he's become immortal. So this is Maisie, who's coming up now, Maisie and Dora. And then we've just got two more after that, so there'll be more groups. Yeah. Thanks, um, and huge thanks to Bryony, who I met many years ago, and we've been starting up. Um, and it's so lovely to be here. Remember the bit. Sorry, so. hello Zoom. Um, and huge thanks to um, Fortune Editors and to Kirsty. It's a real honour to be here reading with everyone. Um, my poem is on page 78, if you want to follow along. Um, Joni Mitchell, Emma Thompson, and my grandmother get drunk and tell love stories. After that night, you sent me flowers to work the next day. Instead of the printed card someone had written in pencil, I'm sorry, kiss. I thought it was you. Words are the sexiest before you say them. My grandmother wrote her love letters on pale blue note paper. I should be studying, but I can't stop thinking about you. For weeks, those flowers kept me going with the handwritten note. It was just a computer glitch. Someone in your office wrote all the notes that day by hand. It might have been her. In this story, I'm the wife who gets the old Joni Mitchell CD for Christmas. When I came to collect my things, you'd left them where I would see them. A lemon tree stripped of lemons, a chili plant in an empty bin. When my grandfather died, she said good night to his picture every evening before bed. I'm thinking of restarting an affair that I had three years ago with a boy who grew up on my street. We both live at home and he's so pretty. I went to his photography exhibition last week. He kept hugging me. I'd love to be ready for this. But last night I dreamt we were together in a hot town where the sea was rising and rising and you wouldn't leave. Someone take my phone and send my messages for me. I'll do whatever you say. Thank you. Thank you very much for meeting me, Laura. So, next up, penultimate reading, we have Maya Pistari. Give it up. <laughs> This is this is what's been going on, right?
instead of hope, write yes. Instead of love, write love. Thank you. being made here at Hamburg. Do you have your, um, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for putting in the magazine. Bryony, Romelin, Posture, Kirsty, it's a real, Pleasure and a privilege. I'm really thrilled for this to be, to be in the mag. Um, I've got two poems in the magazine. I'll read them both. Probably won't have time for another because I'm going to cut along a bit. Um, so, the first poem. Um, this is actually probably one of the most personal pieces of writing I've ever put out there, um, even though in the grand tradition, the grand poetic tradition of running from your problems, I've sort of dressed it up as a Funny poem about a walrus, but it is actually deeply personal. Uh, walrus. What do they think when they hear Kurt, our beloved walrus, smacking his haunch across the shared wall? As his tusk completes its walrus crescent into precious objects, we hope that he might love us back. The cry of the walrus can pimble through a cul-de-sac like a text of a group chat. But they should know we are on good terms with the police who understand our walrus, Kurt, is a wild animal, and we are beholden to the want to clams and the cooling jet of the sailing hose. It's inevitable. We'd also want to see the walrus. Our walks to the Volvo are like rock stones. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so it's more poem in the magazine. Um, so I write a lot about sound and the way we kind of use sounds to kind of extend ourselves through the world through space and as part of that research I ended up reading a lot about phone hackers, phone freaks they were called. They were a gang of kind of, I don't know, nerdy anarchists in the 50s, early 60s who learned how to use sound to hack public pay phones in America and get them to do nefarious things and get themselves into places they shouldn't be. Um, those people actually then went on to invent the internet. Uh, and in reading about the phone freaks that they were called, I found this one guy who was born blind and so had very good hearing in the early age, actually learned to whistle, like, you know, with his mouth and his lips at exactly the right frequencies to just, you know, make free phone calls, get phones to get into government buildings, kind of do it once. That's basically like spellcraft. Um, you know, when I read about this guy, this poem sort of came out fully formed, really. 30 miles from Vegas, Jojo wipes his brow, hurls a grapnel over the high frequency transmitter and climbs. The seeing eye dog lets him work, shows itself beneath the FCC warning sign. Through piezo speakers and solder wire, good men have broken good things found the spells their sounds could pass, taught young Jojo how to whistle. Lips pressed to the desert hot antenna, 
he sings past dial tones and onto data packets, hoping to last the burn of distance, a whisper across the crowded room. 14 minutes and two orbital relays later, the rover spins to life, feels voltage over the ram they had never told it about, begins tracing a word in the Martian fan. Thanks, everyone. Now, certainly not time. Uh, we have Yulia Davis, and apologies for not expecting you on that list that I had written out. Top organisation, Percy Anderson. Thank you very much. And being used to writing paper, it is paper. Um, my bits of paper clearly didn't coordinate. But yeah, here's the Hi, right, yeah, this is all kind of fun. <laughs> um, my gratitude to Roma and uh, Kostya for choosing my poem. I write in the second language, uh, I come from Romania. Um, the poem I'm going to read is called Looping. I have grown taller since I last wrote the poem, since you left. The hem of my dress on Gavin, a map with not so straight lines, no, a painting, the rabbit dreaming in its den, here and there. They say there are men of the East who are the East. I am an orchard disappearing in a new language. Sometimes my hair smells of lonely winds, and sometimes when I dream, I have no hair. I'm still learning that to name the sky of England, the shape of round boxes keeping the R's like hats that I wear when I want to shoot a bird in the wind, only to have something to take home and hear and listen. If you ever bring yourself back home, make it about peas or kimchi or sunrise. Ring the bell, I'm wide awake, it's morning. I rise from fevers and needles, step in my blue slippers, making my way down the halls, all over the breathing cat, a waterfall like a blue tongue stuck in the bottle. They call it love, hear it morning. Down on a dream that's so much about you, but a door is unlocked and I catch the sun with my blueberry mouth open, as if a fly is landing, and I know it's spring. Thank you. Uh, the last poetry was edited by the Faro Gorman and Kostya as well, because they published English in a second language, and that's quite an achievement, really. So, yeah, great. Right, so this is the final adieu from Bryony Bat. So Bryony Bat has kind of took me on board. They were advertising for a job two days a week as a managing editor. I was like, oh, I can probably handle that. Like, um, two days a week job. <laughs> and, uh, and, so I, and I kind of got that going on. So I was, I was kind of up for doing that. But it's ended up taking over my life. Um, really, in the past year, and it's quite fabulous. And Bryony Bax has been doing this for eight years. So can we pass over to you? We can try. We can try. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, OK. So just to say, and Simon's here too, my husband, Simon Bax. So just to say to everybody, thank you so much for tonight. I thought the readings were wonderful. And what was so great about it was that so many people, it's the beginnings of their careers. And that's what Amber is all about, is encouraging everybody and celebrating them at, at the beginning so that we can nurture people. And I've been nurtured by Amber, by all the people I've worked with. And I've loved doing it. And I'm really delighted that Kirsty has jumped so in with both feet um, and Mike is there, Kate is here, 
uh, George is on the on on the Zoom. All these people that we've worked for. So I wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody for your support over the last eight years, and I really hope that you'll support us forever and that Kirsty will take us to new heights. And thank you everybody for coming this evening. And I'm so sorry that we couldn't be there, but lots of love to everybody and thank you. I don't know if they've arrived, um, but yeah. Second thing. I don't know if there's any, if any flowers have arrived. Have they not? Have they not arrived? Constanton flowers. Don't oh, don't worry. That. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I, you know, I I'm feeling the love from everybody, and um, I'm just. I'll just have to text them meanwhile, but you know, yeah. Just he's organised flowers oh. for me to deliver. Oh, I, well, I'm I'm very excited that Kirsty's taking over. She is an amazing person. As I say in my introduction, I think, you know, uh, clad from head to toe in leather with great red hair, she's going to take Ambit to where it's going to be. So thank you, everybody, um, and all the contributors. It's a great issue. Please boast about it on your social media. Tell everybody that you're a part of it because it's really exciting. And um, I'm really glad that everyone was here tonight, both in live and on Zoom. And so sorry, I can't be there to have a pint at the... At the brewery and thank you to london fields brewery we wouldn't be here today if you hadn't hosted it and um been a partner with us so thank you very much indeed mm -hmm. right. All right. so we drink some beer and celebrate <laughs> yeah that great Thank you so much, Bryony. Bryony's been the best boss ever that I've actually ever known. Yeah, great mentor and I'm honored to, to work. <laughs> right. Hello everybody, I'm Simon Madrill. Ambit Magazine was the first poetry magazine I ever bought. So I'm so delighted to be in 
and bit 244. Bryony also published one of my first ever poems, um, but this time in the New European from the poem for Europe section. I hope you enjoy. She never came unannounced. But that afternoon the door knock did. Mums don't need to ask to sit, but she did. Crouch on a dining chair in the lounge. Mums don't need to ask to speak, but she did. Punch memories out with her truth, splattered around the heart. In 1938, not 1992, the teacher spotted the blood running on the playground, draining its way from her head with a hole, the shape of a mother's left stiletto heel. The evacuee sent on a long country vacation, leaving her baby sister behind, both collecting a stash of happy childhood for future masquerades. Innocent flushed out of the cracks. After being dropped on the pavement outside her home, a welcome mat face down behind a locked door. Left a child seamstress in a Shoreditch triangle, an unreconstructed jigsaw, littered with wars, holes, open wounds at home, a sweatshop with a girl in the owner's attic. Mum hid in a raincoat on the street corner, handing out sweets and magazines. Just for that one little girl, too young to remember her sister. Until their mother banned glossies and gobstoppers for free. After all those bells and lemons of sixteen years, self-sacrifice from London Bridge seemed a duty. Faltering, she landed in Holloway instead. Released, she devoted herself to fifty years of nursing. Mums don't need to ask to sit, but she did. Crumple on four wooden legs like a blackbird broken as the evening chased the sun to the moon. Then there was a stillness and a song. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is John Chalice and this is my poem that appears in Ambit 244, Thames. 
After a day of keeping tugs and waste disposal barges, sailing races, showboats and commuter clippers afloat, the Thames turns inwardly to find a space to stretch out in within a space no bigger than itself and burrows through the mud and clay where every London intersects to get its nose beneath the grave, then flips the past up like a coin to send afloat its drowned possessions, Anglo-Saxon ornaments, unexploded payloads, bone dice and oyster shells, wedding rings and number plates, and all those you might have been had your time started early. Grave diggers, barrow boys, mole men and cockle pickers, gong farmers and costermongers, resurrectionists and suicides, the taken, the lost, the given, then settles down to dream again of all its infant waterways, the estuaries and tributaries that led it here among the rusted holes of years to where there is no space to breathe or settle down to sleep. 